basis here. Welcome everybody. We're going to be going through our chapter one slides, just like I magically started from scratch in my video, right? Everybody in the classroom knows differently. We are on slide number 10 here in the chapter one PowerPoint. All right, so this first slide here just talks about what are things and what are connections, and this really kind of relates to kind of the whole concept of what is the Internet of Things, and we talked about that very briefly before, and then what are connections, meaning that, you know, not only are we connecting these Internet-enabled devices, we're connecting them to the outside world through all the network resources that we have. All right, so they start with, what are things? <laughs> well, that's really kind of a bizarre thing to say, um, but IOT stands for the Internet of Things, and really, generally, what it means is small internet-connected devices that have very specific purposes. Really good example that some of you guys might have at home might be like a ring doorbell. Does anybody have one of those? Or maybe uh, like smart cameras that you have connected to your network at home. Um, I always get kind of uh, amazed actually how quickly these things are popping up. Like I walk the dog down the street and I look up and I go, oh, my, that neighbor's got a camera, that neighbor's got a camera, that neighbor's got a camera. And then one day our bike got stolen out in front of the house. So I went to the next door neighbor because it was like parked right in front of his house and locked to the thing. And he pulled up his camera feed and his recording and we couldn't make out any details at all, by the way. Because it was just far enough away and dark enough. It was like, oh, it's some guy in a hoodie. Great, that was really helpful, right? Couldn't tell, you know, if he was old or young or anything, you know, so. Um, but at the same point, right, that data feed is going somewhere. And where is it going? It, you know, what is it connecting to? Now, for any of you that already are using these types of devices, I think it's pretty interesting because you can operate them in a number of different ways. You can privatize the feed, right, if you get the right kind of device, so it just goes through your own equipment. Or what a lot of the ones that you are buying up for consumer level devices, it's being proxied through the cloud. It actually goes to somebody's service and you log into it and you can pull it up on your phone or on your computer and it doesn't matter where you are, right? Now, if you're pulling it up remotely through the cloud, who else is pulling it up remotely through the cloud? Do you think that's really 100% secure? Okay. So if you have a camera in your house that you can monitor that way, I just want you guys to think about that. Chances are others can too. Yeah, I know there are. And that's really scary stuff. Yeah, it's scary stuff, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm not really hearing you guys back there, just so you know. If you're, if you're going to talk, make sure you talk really loud. That's all right. I, I kind of mumble and complain too, so. All right, then the other thing is, is, and this was both in the readings and on those like online slides in, in uh, Net Academy, they talk about the six pillars of the IoT system. And they're talking about network connectivity. We, we do kind of talk about cloud computing, but here's a weirder term, fog computing. Like, what the heck does that mean? Then we have security, both physical and cybersecurity. So in other words, software-based and physical-based security. Uh, the data that's generated, that's pretty huge. Uh, how we manage it, and then also the applications that we enable, that we run off of the devices that are connected, right? So for example, the app you're using on your phone to see the Ring doorbell feed, you know? So it enables all of those things. So it's kind of all those technologies working together. But typically when we're thinking about IoT, we, we normally kind of default and think about the hardware. That's just kind of what happens, right? And so uh, for me, IoT, because the first IoT I ever encountered was a Raspberry Pi, that's where my brain goes first. But that's not all it is. It is that type of device though that we're talking about. Um, they, they make a special thing of talking about different types of 
systems and they talk about systems that are controlled and they talk about systems that have sensors. And I think they had a couple of examples of like how you can have maybe a, a motion sensor, right? That could pick up if somebody's walking by and then snap a picture of them, you know? And I actually did kind of a really weird experiment like this with my Raspberry Pi. Cause I have, you know, I live in kind of like a unique location in Milwaukee. It's a, it's pretty urban, right? And people live very closely together. And I park one of my cars in a, a driveway, uh, kind of just off the street, but it's right by the sidewalk. And every morning I would come out to get to the car and somebody would be spitting on the windshield, right? And it wasn't just regular spit. It was like tobacco-y, whatever. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm gonna figure out who this is. So what I did is I took my jump pack hooked up my Raspberry Pi to it, set up a camera with a piece of software. And so anytime there was motion in front of the windshield, it would snap video. And I ended up calling the person, I was a next door neighbor. They didn't like where I was parked. I, like They thought I was too close to the house, so they'd spit on my windshield. Instead of like knock on the door and talk to me. But man, were they embarrassed. And I'm like, I got video, you wanna see the video? And it's like, <laughs> you know, it was really pretty amusing. But that's an example of the kind of weird stuff that you can do. Now that's just not, you know, technically that's not really a sensor, but maybe if you had uh, like a moisture sensor that you put in the ground and it detected that your soil was dry, it could turn on your sprinkler system. And you know what, they have stuff like that. Or if you're in your house and you have a smart uh, thermostat, it knows when the temperature drops and turns on the furnace. Well, that's not really all that magical because we have we've had thermostats for a really long time so is that really internet of things what makes it internet of things is the computer system inside and the software running it and the fact that it's connected to the internet and you can remote control it that's what makes it all of that all right more devices, actuators and controllers, and then we have the process flow. And, and I'm not going to like read all this stuff to you, but once you start connecting up IoT, what you're realizing is if you have a computer system that can read in data from the outside world and then send commands out also, now we can control external devices. And like, what could we do with that? Well, here's the thing you could do just about anything. Yes, sir. Uh, is this slideshow open? It should be. All right. If you go to the resources page, yeah, yeah, or or you can just watch it on Zoom too if you're if you're not seeing it. You can always take notes if you wish. Um, when we start talking about you know processes, and this is really kind of interesting because this this graphic here is really really hard to see, but I'm gonna like do this goofy thing. Um, but what we're seeing on on the screen here, this is. This fits into what we call a classic systems model for information technology. What a lot of people don't realize is most of information technology is built around this really simplistic concept that you're seeing here. And it's not just IoT. I teach this in my programming classes. I teach it in hardware classes. And the action part is maybe the part where you see different terminology, but generally in a systems approach, you have a system that takes inputs of some sorts, you process it somehow or do something with it, and then you have an output. In programming, we interface with users and we, and we get input, like they type something at the keyboard or click on something. As a result of that, we perform an action and then we put something on the screen to see that it happened. In hardware, it's kind of the same thing, right? If you are operating a piece of hardware, what's going on on the inside after you issue a command like what what is making it do something and who's making it do it you know that's even the, the greater question but they try to apply this really pretty broad stroke to a lot of different things here they're calling it you know input action and output but i'll, I'll just have you put in your head action could be process you know and normally in it when we teach that it's input processing output input processing output another thing that you could look at that you could extend it to physical systems so like if you were in a factory right a factory might receive logs from the forest as input and then they like put them through machines and munch them all down and turn them into pulp and then 
press them into paper and on the other side of the process, you get paper. So they took the log and they turned it into paper, input, processing, output, very, very classic manufacturing and IT and a lot of anything technological. Often when you're working on these kinds of systems, you know, you have that kind of three-step approach, but there's also what we call control mechanisms. You know, so for, for example, sometimes the information loops back and it begins again, or you have something that's like, hey, it's too cold in this room, let's turn on the furnace and heat up the room, and then the thermostat checks again, is it warm enough yet? If not, it keeps running it. Once it gets warm enough, it shuts off the machine, but eventually it'll probably cool down. And so there's a kind of control loop, whether it's automated or manual. Um, Okay, so I mean, these types of concepts really kind of extend pretty far through IT, but they're really kind of showing you here why IoT devices exist for the most part, because we do put them in, the, in place where they can do a lot of this stuff autonomously. And that, that's kind of scary sounding, right? Because it's like, all right, if I program a, a robot on, on how to build something, I'm gonna be out of job, right? But that's not really the way to look at it you should be the person that figures out how to program the robot and fix the robot and make sure it's running because there's your job you know and the classic example is well over 100 years ago like mid 1800s before the industrial revolution really kicked in 95 percent of our workforce was working on farms raising animals or growing food within 100 years less than four percent i think are working on farms now and even on those farms, a lot of those have like robotic tractors and devices, and they use like GPS systems and, and stuff to like navigate the fields and humans don't even do it, right? Are we, do we have less food? Are, are we worse off now? Well, maybe we're, maybe we're heavier all in the middle, right? Because we have more food to eat and we're not as physical, right? Because we, you know, human bodies are meant to move around and stuff. But I think it's kind of fascinating when you start to put it all into that um, perspective. Um, with the change that's happening in society right now, as we kind of move everything to be connected to the internet, because that's really what's happening here. Do you think you could operate at home without the internet connected? Right? There's a whole lot of stuff you can't do. You know, how about if we take away electricity even worse, right? You know, if we took away electric power, how quickly would you guys be like, you know, raising your pitchforks and pulling out your guns and <laughs> causing like a pandemic or, a, you know, apocalypse situation because water doesn't run without electricity, right? And who's got, who's got a stockpile of water? Like nobody. You might have a stockpile of food, but that's not gonna last really long. If you live in Wisconsin and it's cold like it is now, in a day or two, you're gonna be freezing your butt off because you don't have a wood burning stove anymore, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> right? so, so much of it relies on that. Um, the, the fascinating thing about the te technological revolution though, in that we're getting into interconnectivity of all these devices um, is the communication structure is kind of predefined. I know a lot of you are studying networking and cybersecurity as probably a propensity of your programs in this classroom. So that becomes, you know, I'm not here really necessarily to teach you networking concepts, you know, but that, that does filter in here big time. What we're looking at right now, this thing that's on the screen, does anybody know what this is called? This like stack of technologies? Jake? Um, is this like a larger extended version Close, close. You're, you're thinking of the TCP IP yeah, the, uh, layers, right? Yeah. Um, just a general network stack. It, this is kind of a general network stack. And, 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 you know, they don't have the label here, and I think somewhere else they kind of uh, point it out. But this is actually a couple slides down. Okay. Okay. They, they call it the OSI model, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. And so really what this means is when we're doing communication electronically over a network, certain aspects of the network handle certain pieces. Like for example, there's the physical connection, right? I'm taking the cable, plugging it into my computer, plugging it into the wall or into the router. 
or I might have a Wi-Fi card that's sending radio signals. That's the physical, right? Even though it doesn't seem physical, it is. And then once you have it connected, it doesn't mean it's talking, right? That's the data link, right? Once you get them to actually talk to each other. And then once you get them talking to each other, can you connect to other devices on the network? So you see how you kind of build up the layers, right? And if you guys haven't studied this yet, I, I assure you in networking, you will big time. Then you have the transport layer, which means which technologies are we using to move the data around? What's happened in the modern world is we've kind of formalized TCP IP, which is a, a series of network protocols to be our main communication structure for moving information around. Even to the point when we're at home and we pick up our landline and make a phone call, that's also going over that network now. Isn't that interesting? It used to be that way. Did not used to be that way, but now everything is going over that network. If you step back to when I started doing this, we had competing protocols out there. We did have TCP IP, but we also had all the Novell stuff, the SPX, IPX. And then there was a couple of other weird ones that like nobody used, but those are the two big competing protocols. TCP IP went out. Why did it went out? Because the internet is cool. And here's the interesting thing. It was not the better protocol. It wasn't as fast. It wasn't as stable. It was just more popular. And that's kind of it, kind of interesting to think about. All right. When you kind of move, keep moving up these layers, that's where you get into the higher and higher functions of a network. So you get past like the connectivity part, and then all of a sudden you can go to the session layer, which means to log in to, to something. So you can log into a remote thing. The presentation layer, I can see what I'm logging into or connecting with. And then the real powerful level, the application layer. And every time you guys are logging into your Gmail through a browser, that's exactly what you're doing. You're connecting to an application over a network and, you're, and it's running over the network and it seems like it's on your machine. You know, so this is kind of the importance of all this stuff. A lot of this communication stuff, why it becomes kind of important is because when we use IoT devices, they use these network resources to move stuff around the information um, but we often have very specialized aspects of it that we use to do iot stuff so in a really simplistic form we take an iot device we load an operating system on it it just acts like a regular computer and it's on the internet okay great but in industrial situations like if you look at the like the robotic equipment here in the next room what happens is sometimes they use very specific communication technologies that are not TCP IP. They might run over an Ethernet cable or Wi Fi, but they're not using the standard transmission protocols on purpose. Why? To make it more secure or to serve the need of the device to operate more efficiently in many cases. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, notice also they have this like bullet list down here at the bottom where they're talking about the different connection types, right? So they're saying device to device. So it's possible, for example, that I just have, you know, one device connected to another. There's no network in between. And you know what? You can do that with regular computer systems too. You can bypass all the network stuff and just connect machine to machine, right? But you can also connect to the cloud, right? Either to an application, a file store, a database or have devices in between called gateways. So for example, a gateway often is just the router in your house, right? If that router is not in, in, in position at your house to connect you to the internet, you're never getting out to the internet. You don't think about it, but it is a necessary piece of equipment. And if you study networking, you also realize that whenever a signal for the internet leaves your home and goes somewhere, it's not like it goes right from my computer, right to Google, right? That, that's not how it works. This is connecting to wherever the Wi-Fi is in the ceiling here. And then that's connecting to our networking closet. Networking closet's connecting back to Kenosha campus. That's connecting out to our ISP. And then God knows where it goes. And there's technology that you can actually run that will trace what we call the number of hops between devices. And sometimes if you're just going from here to Google, it might hit 20, 30, 40 devices before the signal gets there. 
and then it hits the same devices coming back and you're upset because it didn't respond instantaneously when you pressed enter right so this, i mean this is kind of like and so every device what is it doing every time you're sending a signal what's about where are you going to oh google okay i can hook you up and it bounces all the way across the planet and comes back and it happens like this but we still get frustrated that it's not fast enough and I just think that's really kind of interesting. So take that into account. The fact that everything works as well as it does is pretty darn amazing. It was not always like this, you guys. Ultimately, you know, the, the, the highest level is when we can actually connect through the cloud and operate an application. And that application ultimately can control an IoT device. Ring doorbell maybe is a really good example, right? And you get that feed on your phone and you can see who's like porch pirating your Amazon stuff, right? That you ordered on the cloud. All right, we are at about the halfway point. So we're gonna take a break right now. I hope you guys are cool with that. So we're back from break and we're gonna continue on with the PowerPoint here. We don't have too many more slides to go. Um, so we're, we're still talking about the concept of connections um, and a couple points that they're making on this slide, which I think are kind of interesting. First of all, they're talking about connections within networks. What, what are they really kind of talking about here? Well, if you're on a network, it doesn't mean you're necessarily connected to something. Usually you have to log in, right? So this is a, a kind of an interesting aspect really of being online and being on the internet in general. You know, like when you sit down, you know, at a, you know, a search engine, you know, usually most of us are using Google and we type in a search and we press enter to get results. We're searching what they call the surface web, right? That's probably less than 5% of all the content on the internet, right? And then we have this area of the internet we call the deep web that you access once you're signed out. So for example, if I go to Blackboard and don't sign in, I'm gonna see the Blackboard homepage and a login screen, right? Once I log in, then I can see my courses and all the stuff that goes with that and all the tutorials and all the help screen, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's a really good uh, indication of that. What they're really referring to here is kind of the fact that the type of connection you form with IoT devices can vary. It can be a standard TCP IP like we talked about, but it could be something highly proprietary that is really kind of dependent on what you're doing. And what, what they have as an image here, as you notice with this like Raspberry Pi, it looks like that they have connected, they have all these like weird little circuit boards and wires coming off of it. And that's the kind of stuff you can actually do with, with these devices. They have these special control arrays of pins where you can hook up connectors and you can hook up like bells or robots or devices or actuators or whatever and make them do things. So what kind of connection is that? Hmm. Well, we're not really sure, <laughs> you know, uh, at least not in the context of regular network connections. Most of the time, those connections are physical when you're connecting to devices like that. But uh, we are seeing this really big push in industry that even those types of connections are going wireless, often using very proprietary protocols to do so. Um, we do talk a lot about like, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, TCP IP, Ethernet, you know, kind of like related technologies. Um, you know, depending on the class you guys take with me, sometimes I, I do entire like dog and pony shows about those technologies because I think they're really interesting. Most of our data connectivity happens predominantly over copper wires in the modern world, at least on a localized level. We are seeing more and more fiber optics. So like the backbones of our networks are often fiber optic, especially when we get out of the building. But then we have all these wireless technologies. Some of them we think about a lot and some of them we think about not at all. You know, so for example, we have cellular networks that carry TCP IP signals over them. That's kind of interesting to, to contemplate. And then we have TCP IP networks that carry analog signals over them or digitized analog signals like in the form of a phone call right where in the old days we used to just run over copper wires but copper wires really were the predominant technology basically from the mid 1800s up until really a decade or two ago it's just now that fiber optic and wireless is really kicking in but why would they use copper 
to do all the connections in the past? This is really kind of an interesting question. Well, part of it is cost, but now even a penny's worth of copper is worth more than a penny, right? Copper is actually pretty expensive, even on a recycling level. Yes, sir. It's more conductive than other metals. It is, with the exception of a couple, most notably gold, but there's no way we're stringing gold from foam poles, right? Uh, but copper was no notoriously reliable. That's the why. You know, and it was readily available as well. Very interestingly, if you really kind of study the history of networking, um, there's a technology that came before the telephone. What was the technology that came before the telephone? Pager. No, no, no. You're thinking, you're thinking smartphone. I'm talking like landline because we had like landlines going way back, right? What's the technology that came before regular telephones? Telegraph, right? You guys don't even think about that one. But a telegraph was like the magic technology that really kind of made everything explode. This is like early 1800s through about mid 1800s when that was being developed. They had the first transatlantic telegraph line laid across the ocean. I want you to think about this in the mid 1800s, going from New York to London. Somebody like, let's wire, some, let's take a wire across the ocean. Okay, so this is, sounds really goofy, right? But prior to that, if you wanted to get a message to somebody in London over to, the, to New York City, you'd have to like put, here, get this letter on the boat and go, all right? Two months later, they show up in New York. If, if they were lucky to get there that fast, it's like, oh my God, grandpa's dead. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? You hook the wire up from New York to London and yeah, they were sending Morse code, like short, long taps, right? right all of a sudden, that time barrier is completely removed. Instant information transmission across an ocean completely revolutionized everything. You know? Then we got the phone, used the same technology. It was like basically a power source, some magnets, and some wires. And we were able to talk to people. So not only could you hear what they were saying, Grandpa's dead, but you could hear how upset they were by hearing their voice. Right? Then eventually we figured out ways to use those wires more efficiently. And that's why we came up with TCP IP networks because the old technology worked in a fashion where if you picked up a phone and you were talking to somebody, you were tying up these two copper wires, even if you weren't saying anything, like the awkward pause on the phone call, but you're still tying up the entire line. Somebody's like, well, when we do computer stuff, you know, we type something, press enter, we get a result, we look at it for a while. So there's a lot of downtime. So what somebody figured out is this concept called packet switching, where we broke all our messages into little bits and pieces, transmit them over a shared set of copper wires. That's what networking is. So we use one transmission protocol and we send many messages back and forth across it, broken into little pieces, reassemble them at the far end and we have networking and that's kind of how we got to where we are. Those technologies now have ex extended into these other areas and I think it's really kind of a fascinating thing. What they are talking about though are these, you know, this goes back to what I was talking about, lots of different types of connections. Some of them use standard protocols, some of them do not. What we are discovering, you know, as you venture into industrial machinery in particular, that there is more and more customized protocols that are being used for a lot of different reasons, mostly for efficiency, you know. So they design them very much on the circuit level for specific purposes. Um, all right, one last slide here. Um, you know, see, these are kind of like the, the last wind-up points that they have. But it says the, imp the impact of connections on privacy and security, and you know, this is a, a really deep uh, topic, you know, and not one we're going to solve in this course. But ultimately, there are a lot of concerns once you're connected to a network in any way, shape, or form. Most people blindly accept, you know, what data of theirs is being shared uh, without question, and I think that's a really big mistake. You know, like if you operate in that fashion, it's like, hey, I got a smartphone. Hey, I'm posting everything on Facebook. 
you know, whatever you know your your paradigm is, that's wonderful, but it's also can be very detrimental, and you really got to start to think a little bit about how you use the technology, what you're using it for, what you're sharing, what transmission protocols you're using, what apps you're using, what social media you're signed on to. Did you know, like, if you guys go out and look for a job, some companies will look you up. I mean, wouldn't they be fools not to, right? So when I, when I say look you up, what does that mean? We go into your Facebook page, right? Look, yeah, look, at, the, look at what this person's into. You know, and that might be completely innocent, like pictures of their kids, or it could be like what I had for dinner last night, or it could be like something much more nefarious and, you know, something that might actually make you lose your job or not get the job, you know, and, and these are really pretty deep concepts. Interestingly, the people that are on social media the least are guess which segment of industry. IT people tend to be the least sharing on social media because they get it. Are there, is there anybody here that like doesn't do Facebook, for example? Yeah, I got that. Right. But you guys mostly do it because your parents are doing it, right? Is that, right? Like my kids won't go on Facebook. So, Mom, you're on Facebook, so I'm not going to go on Facebook, you know, you know that kind of thing. Um, but I think in general, IT people tend to be a little bit wiser about what they put out there and how they share it. But you should do a search of, you guys have never done this, search yourself online, see what comes up. Do you like what you see? Hmm. Dun, dun. Yeah, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, all right, so, so there, are, there are a lot of privacy concerns uh, with IoT devices, depending on how you use them. You know, the Ring doorbell is a great example, or cameras inside your house. Um, you know, we had the same issue with baby monitors, you know, whether they were radio ones or video ones that people would put in there. Um, and even though there are ways to secure transmission of devices, I would never count on anything going out over the internet not being able to be intercepted and deciphered somehow, even if you're super clever about covering your tracks. There's always somebody more clever than you that knows how to work around it. Right? The iPhone was uncrackable, but the Israeli government figured out how to do it. And isn't it interesting, Apple didn't even know how to crack their own devices, but somebody figured out how to do it. All right, folks. That ends the, the luxury bit. <laughs>